Okay, so Amphibia True Colors is finally out. And it may be the best single episode of an animated show I've ever seen in my entire life. I just... I, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> I've got notes here. They're right here on my computer screen. They're not helpful at all. Because... <laughs> <it, it, sighs> Do I start with how fantastic this episode looked? About how it used lighting more effectively than most blockbuster films? How the music... While still clearly the music of this show was epic in scope and perfectly appropriate for every single scene. Like, I guess I'm just going to run through a brief synopsis of the story. I'm going to be real brief with it, though, frankly. Because I'm, I'm working under the assumption that you guys have seen the episode. Because it's not like it's technically new. It's been out for a while, thanks to the leak. So I'm going to assume you've seen it and just kind of run through the synopsis really quick. If you're interested also, you can see my authentic first impressions of the video in the VOD of the live from yesterday. Because holy shit. And also, goddamn. And also, wow. There you go. There's my first impression. Uh, that basically sums up the vibe of them. There's more to it, though. Go watch that is my point. It was a lot of fun. Bring your own copy of the episode. Though, you'll know about when to start it. Though, I did watch it live on television, so there's ads in there too, commercials. So just, just be aware of that. It, it was a fun time, though. I really enjoyed hanging out with you guys for that live. I hope to do more stuff like that in the future. Not sure with what, but I'll find something, I'm sure. You know, it really speaks to how remarkable this episode is that one of the least remarkable things about it is how... For a decent chunk of the episode, probably like half the episode-ish, this episode goes exactly how I expected it to. Like, it was still excellent. Like, just a fantastic episode of this show. But it was exactly the finale that I expected to get, based on everything leading up to it. Our merry band of main characters shows up at Newtopia via... Marcy's bird instead of the flagon, because apparently they packed the flagon for literally no reason at all. Grime already has forces in place in the city, which makes sense. He just needs the others to get him close to the king to enact his plan. He and Sasha do their thing. They take over the kingdom. <laughs> they have the rest of their army moving to come in and really secure things. And Anne and her group try to stop them from doing that. And if that had just been what the episode was, it would have still been so satisfying. Because I still love to see these characters do all the things that these characters do. But then, in an episode where Sasha is lounging in the throne, being just, just so Sasha about things, almost seeming bored that she was able to take over the kingdom so easily. The moment when they pull a Thor Ragnarok on us, and she and Grime pull down a tapestry in the throne room and reveal a mural behind it, which confirms so many of the things we've been speculating up to this point, and reveals to her that Andreas is genuinely bad and a legitimate threat to everything that he's sus basically right that he's he's super duper sus and maybe you know this shouldn't be a game to her maybe she and grime should like be legitimately trying to stop him it switches everything around suddenly and so effectively that you don't even get whiplash from it it just it feels like the natural progression of the story suddenly Anne and her party are the antagonists Trying to restore a tyrant to power. Unknowingly, of course. But that's still what they're doing. And Sasha and Grime and their forces are the protagonists of the show now. The heroes of the show. Trying to depose a horrible despot. But even at this point, the tone of the show really hasn't shifted that much. Like, we saw Andreas with that weird creature under the castle. And yeah, that was really weird. And pretty creepy. But this is only about on par with that, right? But it's definitely a suggestion of things to come. Because while the 
subsequent conflict between Anne and Sasha, the one that's teased in the season two opening, and the conflict between Grime and Sprig that felt very much like a finished redo of their very brief clash from the old pilot. The tone of the show remains the same. The focus is on these characters centered around the three girls and their relationship, primarily the specific dichotomy between Anne and Sasha that we've already spent so much time on. It isn't until Sasha and Grime are captured, Andreas is freed, and they expect that the three of them will be sent back home because that's what Andreas promised he would do, and also that way they, that would get Sasha out of his hair. When he does some standard villain gloating, but, like, not the kind that makes him seem incompetent. The kind that makes him seem like someone who genuinely believes he has nothing to worry about in this scenario. And that he has the power to back it up. That That's when the whole tone of the show shifts. Everything gets so much darker. <sighs> I haven't even talked about the little little flashback section at the beginning, but I'll get to that in a second. Because it just it just piles more on here at the end. Like, it never gets to the point that it's overwhelming or anything. This tone of dread that permeates, like, the final act of this episode. But it's still a lot, man. <laughs> and it just... It, it's a lot already, and it, it keeps getting more and more a lot as the episode progresses towards the climax. But Andreas gives a villain speech. It becomes clear how much bigger this whole situation is than just the three girls. I think it was was it Anne who said it, I think. He even says that the three of them were so focused on themselves that they didn't notice what was going on around them. This world expands so much all at once. Suddenly, all three of them, regardless of the the conflicts in their past, and there's even some conflict between... Marcy and the others at this point, but I'll get into that in a second. In spite of all of that, they're now all fighting together, <laughs> along with their various allies, to stop Andreas, because it turns out he's not an explorer. He is, as people theorized early on in the life of the show, a conqueror, the last remnant of an ancient version of Amphibia that used to conquer other realities. And his entire-ass castle is a big airship, with, a, with an enormous gun on it that can just vaporize whole towers in one shot. Not only that, but he can seemingly beam power from his floating castle back down into the Earth to reactivate the old robot factories, like what Frobo came from, and instantly constructs an entire army of evil Frobos and states outright that his plan is to invade Earth, that he really does want to send the girls home it's just, he doesn't want to send them home until he's ready to go too, because he doesn't want them warning anyone. So that was a theory from very early on in the show that turned out to be spot on. Good on all the theorists, myself included. Like, there's no mention about the many-eyed beast in this episode, or what what stake it might have in all of this. But, um, there were some acknowledgments of it, which, which was enough, I think. Like, the, the mural showed the eyes of the beast behind everything else that was happening in it. I'll try to remember to put images up of the mural here when I'm talking about it. And during Andrea's villain speech, there's a flashback that I'm going to talk about in a minute. When I talk about all, like, the pathos in this episode. That's the right word, right? Doesn't matter. You guys know what I'm talking about. When I get into the character stuff in this episode, I'll talk about it in more detail. But there's a flashback. And we see the city lit up by the power of the stones in the past, a thousand years in the past, which is super interesting. And the weird coralish uh, throne that Andrea sits on, when everything's lit up by like lines of light, the spaces in the coral look like the eyes of that creature, implying that even back then it was the power behind the throne. So I, I still don't know exactly what role it plays in all of this. But it has to be tied to this conquest plot somehow, right? And of course, there's a fight with Andreas here at the end. They stand up to him 
it becomes very clear, first from context clues, from their reactions and stuff, and then from the fact that they fight against the evil robots too, in a limited capacity, that the members of his court didn't know what he was planning. He just didn't care. He thinks he's so in control of the situation that it didn't matter to him. And when they all line up and stand against him, when all the heroes line up and stand against him, it feels for just a second like the tone is lightening up again. Like this is just like any other fight in the show, where it might get brutal for a minute, but then the heroes are going to come out on top and learn a lesson and go about their day. But then the way Andreas fights is just brutal. He um, kills Frobo, or at least destroys him. He's a robot. They'll fix him. And um, <laughs> it's one of my dogs. Um, tries to straight up murder Polly. If she hadn't sprouted her legs like I thought she might by the end of this episode, she wouldn't have escaped. She would be dead right now. Like, I know she's a cartoon character and she was always going to escape because that was what was in the plot. But it doesn't change the fact that this character we've been following, if she hadn't sprouted those legs, there wouldn't be another narrative convenience to get her out of that situation. He was going to murder a child. And then he, as much as murders another child, pretty much immediately after that, after they manage to get the box away from him, he captures Sprig and holds him out the window of the floating castle and threatens to drop him. And even though they do what he says, give him back the box and then let him round them up, he still does it. He'd still drop Sprig out the window to plummet to his death. And it's only because Marcy has her bird mount, Joe Sparrow, I think is his name, that Sprig doesn't die here. <laughs> and again, like that's because the episode is written that way. But the true beauty of a good narrative is that you walk away from it and that doesn't even cross your mind. You don't think, man, it was cool how they wrote that story. You think, wow, I'm glad that those characters were able to save their friends or save the kingdom or defeat the villain, right? It really did feel in that moment like this character could die. And it was only because they happen to have the relationships that they do, that these characters happen to have the relationships with who they do, that he didn't. But in that moment, as things seem more dire than ever, it turns out Goku's power level was actually high enough that he could transform into a Super Saiyan. He just needed some grief and anger to drive all the other emotions out of his heart and cause him to focus wholeheartedly on becoming stronger. And Frieza killing Krillin was exactly what he needed to do that. Actually, sorry. Um, so the wrong notes. It turns out, though, that Anne's power level was actually high enough that she could turn into a Super Saiyan. She just needed some grief and some anger to drive all the other emotions out of her heart. Anne turns Super Saiyan, guys. She thinks Sprig is dead and she goes Super Saiyan to fight Andreas. And again, it feels for a second like things might be okay. Like the tone is lightening up again as she just mows through everything he tries to send at her. But then the power-up ends, and she's weakened by it, and she can't do it again, and they have to run. <laughs> and they don't all make it. And this is the scene that 100%, I'm sure, got the episode delayed. Probably the other stuff happening around it contributed. And definitely somebody at Disney should have caught this earlier and had them, you know, I don't know, show it in silhouette or something, rather than delay the episode the last minute. But this is 100%, I'm 100% sure, the scene that got the episode delayed. <sighs> Turns out, there's a flashback at the beginning of the episode, I already mentioned this, where we find out that on Anne's birthday, the day when they steal the music box, Marcy found out that her dad got a job in another city, that she's moving. And she is so heartbroken by the thought that she might be separated from her very best friends that she does something stupid. Earlier, while she was at the library, she found a book on the floor. 
a book which contained a picture of the music box and explained that it can be used to travel between worlds. And she can't possibly have thought it would work. She even says as much in the episode. But she sees it in that shop. And so it turns out she was the one who originated the idea to steal the music box in the vague hope that it would work and that she and her two best friends would be sent to Amphibia where they wouldn't have to separate. And this whole time that she's been here since then, she's been justifying her choice, trying to make the best of this because now she's terrified that she'll lose her friends from two different angles. That if they go home, she'll lose them because her family's going to move away. And if she stays and they find out, she'll lose them because she betrayed them. And so, as our heroes retreat, through the portal to Earth that Marcy was able to open using the box, she pauses for a minute. And in that moment, I thought, because Anne had already indicated through dialogue earlier, that she's willing to forgive her friends for the mistakes they made here. I thought Anne was going to reach out, like pull her into a hug or something, and they would fall through the portal and end up on Earth together. Or that that moment of hesitation would give Andreas time to charge and maybe knock the others through the portal and Marcy would be stuck back with him. But no. Instead... Andreas stabs her through the back, out through her chest, and she falls to the ground, seemingly dead. And then, the other characters fall back through the portal and end up on Earth. And the box, it seems, remains in Amphibia. And Marcy's not dead. As I said during that live stream that you guys should definitely go watch, as Wanda Maximoff would say, it's not that kind of show. This is not the kind of show that would show a character get stabbed to death in, like, full view of the camera. It's still a kid's show on Disney, after all. And they still agreed to air the episode, if that being a disclaimer before the episode that it has some shocking scenes near the end. And the inclusion of a post-credit... It's not a scene, it's not really even really a trailer, but it, it's the season three opening sequence in which we see Marcy in a pod reminiscent of Dragon Ball Z because obviously this crew is wearing their anime influences on their sleeves at this point being restored she is going to be healed and Andreas is probably going to find some way to weaponize her against the others like I still fully believe that by the end of this they'll be able to assuming it happens break her out of whatever he does to her and get her back but she is definitely seeing some real consequences to the decisions that she made. And yet, I don't think she should at this point. I don't think that she's to blame for this at all. Like, yes, she did that thing. She convinced the others to steal the box and open it with her in the hopes that it would transport them somewhere else. But like I said before, she had no way of knowing that that would actually happen. And then she was alone in this world for so long, desperately trying to justify her choice, which is when Andreas wormed his way in, revealing that he was an explorer who wanted the box to explore other realities and she could bring her friends with her. Wouldn't that be great? She is not responsible for this, and she is certainly, as some fans have said, not responsible for nearly being killed. That is still Andreas' fault. He is responsible for that. He did not have to stab her with a sword. And I'm not, like, angry that fans are reacting that way. Obviously, the character should see consequences for her mistakes. Just not those. That is way more than she deserves. And I love that it is completely unambiguous whether or not Anne intends to forgive her for the mistakes that she made. Maybe Sasha would be slower to forgive. But of course, Anne would forgive her. It might take some time. They might have to talk it out. But she is very clear that she is willing. Like in that moment where they're all standing against Andreas, she says flat out that the three of them, the girls, may have made some mistakes, but he can't turn them against each other because mistakes are not evil and he, and he is evil. And it was very cool. It was a very cool scene. In fact, so much of this episode was just really cool scenes. If you guys don't know, there's a term in the anime fandom, uh, Sakuga. It's uh, when a show really kicks up its animation 
where it, where it's clear that the show has saved their animation budget for specific, really important, visually compelling scenes. And this episode had so much stock again in it. There were whole scenes where the expressions were so much more detailed and so much more uh, well animated than, than even usual. And Anne's Super Saiyan moment against Andreas was gorgeous. Utterly beautiful. Some of the best animation I've ever seen in my life. It, 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 it stuns me how competent this episode is. I... Like, you know how sometimes you'll experience a piece of media and it feels like your soul left your body? This episode had, like, four of those. Two minor ones when they do the, the flip and turn Sasha and Grime into the heroes of the story for a little while. And before that, when we see the mural. And then two big ones when we see Anne have her Super Saiyan moment, or whatever they're going to call it in this show eventually. And then again, when Andreas stabs Marcy, when he didn't even have to, he could have plowed right through her, knocked her to the side, and got into the box and got into the others. But he took the time to stab her instead and then make a little quip about it, because he's just a bad dude. And what's interesting is he's the kind of bad dude who seems to have convinced himself that he doesn't have any other choice than to do what he's been doing. Which not only explains some of his weird idiosyncrasies as a villain, but makes him super compelling as a character going forward. He might even be redeemable. I hope not, because he stabbed Marcy and she's the best, and I hate him for that. I would like to see that happen to him now, too. But it's possible. And it all stems back to the flashback scene I talked about when we see the age when Amphibia was still like a Magitech empire, right? First of all, we see in the mural three figures co colored with the three girls' magic colors standing atop the box being held up by Andreas, which tells me flat out that the box used to be used for something else until it was lifted up by Andreas and his 1,000 years ago regime and put to a different purpose, that being conquest. And that's substantiated by the fact that it's a music box, and yet by setting it on a pedestal in the castle, it powers up the castle and all of this crazy robot-constructing military tech all over the frickin' world, all over their world. Like, if the power source, the box, were built for this, it would just be a thing that plugged into their castle somewhere. It, instead, they have an interface built into the castle that's meant to draw power from the box. As if the box and the castle aren't technically compatible. They've had to jury-rig a means of compatibility between the two of them. So clearly the music box came first, and then Andreas' vision to make Amphibia better by expanding its influence by conquering other worlds came next. And yet in that same flashback, we see the other two amphibians from that old portrait with him turning their backs on him and walking away. And then it seems that one of them, who is very clearly, she's, she's the frog that we saw in that portrait. She's very clearly feminine. She's very clearly a she. And she could not look more like Sprig and Polly. I mean, I'd say if they drew her that way, but they drew her that way. They drew her to look so much like Sprig and Polly. I don't know that she's their mom, but I definitely feel like she's their ancestor. I think she might have come before Hop Pop, frankly, and I'll talk about that in a second. And it definitely seems like the shadowy figure that steals the box away and ends Amphibia as a engine of conquest was that feminine frog. If you look, this figure seems to be wearing a similar kind of hood and has this bumpiness to their, the front of their head that looks like the tufts of hair coming from underneath that character's hood. So my theory is that this other great amphibian who, like Andreas and the toad that's standing with them, is definitely now 100% confirmed to be colored with one of the three colors of the stones, implying a connection between the three of them 
to the stones prior to them rising to power and forming an empire. I think she took the box, ran off with it, hid it on Earth using its power, and then founded the Planter clan, equipping that family with a book that described the box as a calamity box, as a danger, in order to try to preempt when Andreas finally tried to reclaim the box and reclaim his old power. I think the planters have been this entire time destined to stop him with the help of some others, obviously. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that the three of them were heroes associated with the gems, maybe even heirs to the gems' power, who decided that the best way to keep Amphibia safe wasn't to just be heroes with that power, but to literally rise up and take charge, and that it was Andreas who took things too far, and the others, being his friends, not wanting to really hurt him, just went their separate ways, and in doing so made it impossible for him to continue without them. That these three amphibians that we see in this flashback started out essentially as Anne and Sasha and Marcy, because Andreas seems to detest the friendship between the three of them, and even draws parallels between their friendships and his past friendships multiple times in this episode. Like, that little flashback scene was so quick, they barely dwelled on it. It was like 30 seconds of screen time. And man, it implies so many things. It's definitely the most interesting scene in what is already an extremely interesting episode. I even, and this is a bit of a stretch, I even think that maybe this feminine frog founded the planter family and got things rolling with that prior to sending the box off. Maybe Andreas even got too close and she realized she had to move the box out of Amphibia to keep him from discovering the true purpose behind her family. And I think she could still be alive. If I'm right and they are inherently connected to magic, not just connected to the stones, but like their families come from a lineage that is connected to the magic that the three stones connect to, because that's still definitely a thing. The, the magic doesn't specifically come from the, the stones. I'm more sure now than ever. Then she would have had the potential to grow just as old as Andreas, and he confirms outright that he's more than a thousand years old in this episode. So I think she could still be alive, and I think she might have gone with the box back to Earth. I think she's there. I think we're going to meet her next season. She may have even had some reason to set all of this in motion. Maybe she realized Andreas was going to break eventually, or that that beast would eventually grow strong enough to help him conquer anyway, or something. And so she got the ball rolling on all of this. It could have been something that was set in motion on purpose. What else is there to say about this one? Oh, yeah, okay, so Anne's powered up design. I really like how it causes the various foliage that's been stuck in her hair this whole time to grow, symbolizing so plainly that this world is a part of her now. How cool was that? And also, how interesting is it that when Andrea sees her power up, he doesn't say she still has the power or something, he specifically says she's still connected to the stone. Not that she's still connected to the temple or whatever, something along those lines, or connected to the box or something. He specifically says she's still connected with the stone. This is what I was alluding to earlier. It seems like either a person can be a conduit for this power, for one of these three powers, or the stones can. And that you have to move the the specific power that anchors within the conduit from one to the other for one or the other to work. And that what Anne did when she stopped that from happening early was she created a bridge between herself and the stone so that either can act as the conduit now. Because frankly, if it was just as simple as either her having to be charged up or the stone having to be charged up, then the charge in the stone right now would be not just finite, but also lesser than what it needs to be to power the box and therefore the entire castle and all the other stuff that it connects to during this episode, and yet it's not. And yet Andreas is still able to use that technology to its fullest, 
which means the stone is not drawing on its own power. It is simply acting as a conduit for a power source elsewhere, and I still think that's Amphibia itself. More so now than I ever have before. Otherwise, the box and Anne wouldn't be able to tap the full potential of that power at the same time. It's just not possible. Even magically speaking, because the magic in this still seems to follow a certain logic. I'm trying to think. I'm so disorganized right now because there's there was so much going on in this one. Like, by the time I was done writing out my notes, I was just, like, writing out extra stuff. And even then, I missed a couple of things that I've talked about in this video. I think that's it, though. Dear God, this episode was such a wild ride. And it was so good. <laughs> this, if this wasn't my favorite animated show, definitely running right now, but maybe ever. It's certainly a contender for both of those things now. It's definitely my favorite animated show running right now. That, that I'll, I'll admit to 100%. It may be my favorite animated show ever at this point. This was such a strong finale. And the opening for season three, where we see, first of all, that Marcy is in some capacity still alive, but also get a feel for what the show is going to be like, at least for the foreseeable future, has gotten me so intrigued. It seems like Anne's going to be out with her parents about the existence of the planters, and they're just going to be chilling on Earth, interacting with and forming a community with the people in Anne and Sasha and Marcy's hometown the same way that Anne came to fit in with the people back in Wartwood, which is such an interesting idea. And the opening has so many instances of new human characters being put in the forefront, like focused on, implying that they're going to be important. And I'm, I'm looking forward so much to seeing who they are and what role they play in this show, which looks like, for a while at least, it's going to be kind of a Monster of the Week kind of show. That the, the distance between Anne and the stone keeps Andreas from sending a full force through like he wanted to. And so now he's just trying to get her back so he can use the full power of the box again. And so he's going to be sending through various different kinds of robots that they have to fight. Which sounds like a lot of fun. Like that's all speculation based on stuff in the opening and considering that when we finally got to it, the fight between Sasha and Anne didn't turn out to be exactly like it was implied to be in the Season 2 opening. Some of those things could be slight misdirects, right? But I'm still super interested in it. I still want to see what it's going to be like. I didn't think I'd like it if they went to Earth, but now I'm super hyped about it. If you haven't seen this episode, though, and I can't imagine why you wouldn't have if you're a fan of this show, go watch it. Holy crap, it was so good. And then, you know, maybe... As you're watching it, watch my live reaction to it. That could be fun, right? And if you're someone who's been on the fence about this show and hasn't watched it yet, first of all, sorry for spoiling the best episode of the show so far. But also, this is a good time to go watch it. Go catch up on it now during the break between seasons. It absolutely deserves your attention. It's so good. As per usual, though, guys, I'd like to know, what do you think of Amphibia True Colors? Finally, finally, if you have seen it. Let's get a discussion going in the comment section down below and all of that other outro stuff. I can't even, I can't even focus on my own outro. I'm still so hyped about this episode. Just, you know, talk about it in the comments. Do it. Do it for me. <laughs> and either way, I'll talk to you guys later. <laughs>